All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm just going to start us off today with a little introduction. Uh, welcome to the second Digital Ladders Ask Me Anything session. This one is on working with digital specialists. Um, I'd like to start today by acknowledging that the BC Alliance for Arts and Culture is located on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. Um, and we're grateful to be here on this land. Always lovely to work with the uh, BC Alliance for Arts and Culture and their membership. A uh, little passion place for me is culture and keeping culture, independent culture alive. Um, I'm one of the co-facilitators and co-designers of the whole Digital Strat um, Ladders program that has this AMA series is the end of our second season of Digital Ladders. And uh, the purpose of Digital Ladders was to create several different access points for folks to be able to start to learn more about digital um, tools, how they can be used to help you organize yourself and work together, how it can be used to help you connect to your audience and how digital tools can be used in different ways of um, expressing your creativity from individuals to large organizations. So it's been a real fun um, project to work with and all different kinds of people. We need to thank uh, the Canada Council they are the funders of this program, so big kudos to them for allowing us to do this. I'm going to behave a little bit as your moderator today. We have two speakers, Andrew Singh and Jai Dwa, who are going to be our experts. They are going to start with a little presentation, introducing themselves in a little presentation, and then we're going to go into questions. Um, the way to ask a question is you can either put your question, type it right into the chat, or you can just put into the chat like the question mark or just the word question. And I know to call upon you in my speakers list um, to ask you to take your mic um, off mute so that you can ask the question. And we were gonna try and proceed through all of this in the uh, time that we have. Um, if you have the ability to put your camera on, it's always sweet to see each other and be in community, but I know that's tough sometimes, especially over lunch, but if you can, it's fun to see you. Um, I will now pass it over to Andrew and Jai to start with their little presentation. And right from the get-go, if you start to have questions, you can start to put them into their chat. Okay, over to you two for a bit. Great, thank you. Um, Jai, should I go first to introduce myself? Okay, great. Um, so my name is Andrew Singh and I have been working in the art sector for over 15 years. And I'm very dedicated to the work that we're all doing together. Um, and I'm very proud to work in this sector as well. Um, over the past uh, 11 or 12 years, I have been expanding my skills in the digital realm. Um, so I regularly keep up with um, upgrading my skills and my studies. I'm always in school, it gets exhausting, but it's very useful to keep my training up to date. Um, so my background is in, um, there is some IT, and then also recently it's been software and web development. Excuse the cat, she does this a lot. Um, and uh, recently I've been working on quite a few projects. So um, I've been working as a, the technical director for the culturebrew.art project, which is a project that aims to build a digital platform to increase the visibility of BIPOC artists across Canada. Um, another project I'm working on is with Pacific Legal Education and Outreach. They're building a digital platform for the nonprofit sector to get legal advice and support. It's an excellent project that just started. And I just uh, worked on a project that just recently launched with um, Van City Community Foundation called BC Rent Bank, which is another um, platform that was built. So my interests have largely been in platforms and in creating these sort of online digital environments that will help um, the arts sector and by default, the nonprofit sector because we're so connected, um, do our work more easily and the way that I really like to approach things is I really want to see us doing the high value work, not the administrative boring stuff that really technology can really help us do. Um, and I and I worked with Jai for a long time, so I'll pass it on to Jai and I, I learned a lot from Jai. So I'm excited about today's session. Yeah, yeah, I know. Thanks, Andrew. And I mean, um, before I just talk about myself, I think one of the things was that, uh, you know, when we decided to do this AMA, Angie had talked to me about some issues that she was recognizing in the sector. 
you know, which I think that is the challenge of working, you know, as an arts professional or in, in, in management in, of an arts organization and trying to communicate needs and wants to a freelancer or a web agency um, and trying to figure out, like, especially when there's issues around, you know, gender and race and technology and language and all of the things that sort of barriers between having a conversation. And I think that um, it's really, I think, from that perspective that we wanted to start to have this conversation to try and kind of demystify some of the things that you may have encountered or to talk about some of the things that we um, in order to, um, you know, address those things. And so my background is basically uh, five years going on almost 30, I guess now um, of years in technology. Uh, and uh, I ran an agency called Agentic, um, and I formed that in 2000. And it really was focused around social change, working with companies and organizations that were focused on using technology for progressive means. And that's really been the the the, the work that I had prior to that, um, and worked mostly in electroacoustic music. Um, I have an MFA, um, and uh, really looked at using technology for um, different ways of making art. Um, luckily, and, and Angie has been one of the catalysts for bringing me back into the electroacoustic music field. Um, I've just sort of rediscovered it lately, so it's been really exciting for me. Um, I call myself a creative technologist and to the work that Angie does now. Um, in 2016, sorry, just a, one note was that um, my youngest child left for university and I didn't feel like I wanted to kind of like hit the you know, kind of pavement as hard as I had been running an agency. So I really uh, kind of right sized it down just to myself and an assistant and started working more with, you know, organizations um, and uh, like Angie work on platform projects, um, which are sort of large scale, I'd say, creative digital projects that organizations want to do. Last year and a half, I've also been working a lot in coaching. I see a few of my clients, um, my coaching clients. Um, hey, Jessica, um, you know, here. Uh, I also teach design. Um, I teach design and user experience at Emily Carr. I'm on the faculty of the Ideas Design at Capilano. Um, for a number of years, I was also teaching at the Sauter School, um, teaching digital storytelling and uh, so BC Arts Council. Jai, we're getting some funky stuff with your sound where you're cutting out into little blips. Uh, how's that? Is that better? Yes, sounds better right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's really the, the the kind of intro for me. I think that um, if we want to go to the questions, I think what we wanted to do was the first area we were thinking about was, you know, larger issues around communication, how to uh, communicate back and forth. Um, but Angie, do you want to take the first question? Yeah, I mean, I just really like this question. I think it's such an interesting question. It's um, uh, so it's after hiring, working with a digital specialist to create a website, can the artist learn to maintain their own site without always relying on the specialist? And this is a really interesting question to me because this speaks to sustainability. And I think that in the arts, especially when we, um, you know, there's been a lot of initiatives that have happened recently that I'm really excited about. Like, I'm glad that the Canada Council for the Arts has the Digital Strategy Fund. I'm glad that things like digital ladders exist. And I'm glad that we have so much support in these areas. But I feel like a lot of arts organizations in particular, there's always this like nerves around sustainability. Like, can we keep paying a developer upwards of, you know, $150 plus an hour sometimes um, to continue to do uh, this work? And where are we going to get that funding? And, you know, the grant burnout, like we're all sick of writing grants all the time. <laughs> and so I think that this, this is a really um, interesting question to me. And I think that the answer for me, and I really would love you to speak next to this, Jai, because I'm curious what your answer would be, is that, yes, I think the artist can learn how to maintain their site after a developer starts it. But I think it's super important to let the developer or the person, the specialist that you're working with know early upfront that this is your goal. And I think that for me, the way that I like to go into that kind of engagement is if I tell them right away, like my intention is not to rely on you, not because I don't value you or not because I don't want to pay you, but because of sustainability, um, I think that they will really understand that. And then early in the build, they might do things a little bit differently knowing that you will need to update it. 
And so I think that's a big piece for me is that uh, this kind of ties into our first topic, which is commun early communication of your needs. And um, the one thing that I found was when you communicate early, as you're building through, they will also include you in the journey of learning as you go. So instead of at the end, them just doing one big training, they might bring you along to be like, oh, we built this, by the way, this is how you will edit. And so I think that it'll change the process of the project. Yeah, I would echo that. I think that it is like, like key in my work is to make it so that I'm not necessary. And I think that a lot of organizations should try to have the same kind of aspect. And it's a great way that Angie was kind of formulated that. You know, I think that one of the things that I notice is, is that, you know, it's easy to do homework in this. So, you know, like not that, you know, little knowledge can be a dangerous thing, but also a little knowledge can also help you get to where you need to go. And so, for example, if your website, you know, you decide with your vendor that you're going to build um, it in WordPress. Well, like the Vancouver Public Library has lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com that you can access and learn basics around WordPress. Um, you can learn about these different technologies. If there's one thing the um, internet does well, it's to talk about the internet. So there's lots of ways that you can get up to speed so that at least you can have the same language and vocabulary. And obviously, you know, the for many vendors, one of the things Andrew and I have talked about is like, how they approach you, you know, do they approach you as um, kind of a vendor supplier, you know, kind of, you know, you're, you're just a client um, and that's what that is. Um, or do they treat you as a partner or in some way they're looking to work with you in the long term and are really out for your own, your best interest. I guess maybe that's a difference that I see sometimes where an agency will be looking out for their best interests in order to maximize the return from you or to quickly get through your project. Whereas if you can get a vendor that acts more like, well, what's your best interest and how can I support your goals? That it's gonna you know, really fill into that idea that they'll be on board with saying, hey, you know, like we want you to be able to take over the site. Yeah, and if I can just jump off from there, I think there's uh, an important thing that Jai's um, referring to here, which is also um, the, the level of respect that you have between yourself and the vendor in terms of, you know, when we go to vendors, they're, all, they're often, um, some developers will treat us though as though we don't know what we're talking about or we don't know what we need. And I think it's really important that when you look for this person to work with, that they have a risk that they respect your vision and your needs as well. And I think that happens a lot. That happened to me a lot, especially as a woman of color. And it was like really a, a real experience, often dealing with like dude developer types and technology types who are just like, you don't know what you're talking about, but we do. We know what we want to build and we know what we need. And that's why this early communication of saying, we know what the sustainability of our organizations is. Um, and I think that that's why it's always been really helpful to have people who have an arts background um, on the tech technology side to help with that. And that's where I think, uh, I think both Jai and I have that. We have a really strong arts background. We have an understanding. I understand even just like Jai and I were talking about the timeline and the expectation of capacity. I know those grant schedules. I know when it's like gr what I call grant hell. Like I know October, September, October is not a great time to demand a lot of things from uh, a client who's building a digital product who is um, from the art sector. Um, and so I think that just having them understand and respect your where you're coming from is an important piece of that. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting too, like um, Angie and I had talked about like this idea of how you keep um, your, your developer updated and how you handle expectations. And I know from being like my background in the agency, I don't know, we developed like I, I think at the end, close to 9,000 projects. And it sounds incredible, but you know, some of them are very small and some are very large. But like consistently, there's things that I notice that if the client did, or you know, in this case, if you guys do this or you folks do this, it will help with it. You know, one is to try and understand the expectations up early in terms of what is it that you want from this project and what does it look like in terms of success? One of the things that we started doing um, that was helpful was like, a pre-mortem. I'm sure you've heard of a post-mortem about like what goes wrong after a project's it's ended. Sometimes we did um, a pre-mortem and that just looked like 
discussing with our own internal group and with the, the developer, what could go wrong? Um, and what were th ways that we could kind of mitigate that? Because a lot of the times I found, especially working with organizations that had multiple departments, there was a lot of wisdom in the room. But sometimes people didn't want to say what they really felt or believed because they were worried that they would look stupid or they felt like they wasn't their place to, you know, point out the, 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 the issues of dysfunction within that organization. But of course, as we know, these things aren't hidden, right? Like they just come out, right? And unfortunately, when they come out in the worst possible time, they really do affect the project. So there's a nice way of doing it. And you can Google this, you know, uh, pre-mortem uh, concept because it's really out there in a lot of different project management methodologies of just thinking about and sharing like, well, what are the things that could go wrong? And that's where people can blue sky without it seeming threatening. Um, um, and um, very helpful. But Andrew, you were going to talk as well a little bit more about like client expectations and how to kind of manage that too. Yeah, I think that this, this is an interesting thing because I, in my experience, I feel like sometimes there is this expectation. I mean, I, I have to admit that I have a, a really strong affiliation with the arts community and the perspective of uh, the client who is from the art sector. And so I do understand that the developers need things, um, but I also feel like there has to be this early discussion around the expectations of what we can expect from, um, especially clients from the art sector. So first of all, uh, we're, no one no one that I've worked with from the art sector is just, this is all they're doing. When you're usually building a website or a digital tool, this is usually one of like a hundred things on your plate. You have five grants to write, you have this these other projects to do, you have communications to do. And so I think right up front telling, developers don't always understand that or digital specialists don't always understand that. And so if you're gonna work with somebody who's not from the art sector, I think it's really a good idea to explain to them up front that you know little things like, hey, if you need content from me, I need two weeks notice or three weeks notice. If you need two hour meetings to discuss design or direction, you know, let's talk about it in advance. And I think that that's a really um, important conversation that needs to happen early on um, because there is this expectation that when you engage a digital specialist that you're super invested in building this thing, which we are, and that you have the capacity to just always prioritize it at the top of your day every day, which we don't. And so that's, I think that that's something that I would say has been a big piece of learning for myself and my clients. Cool. Yeah, and it's interesting it? to see um, how, I mean, oh, Sue, did you want to move on to the next question? We just got okay. a couple questions coming in here. So um, are we good to take a question? Yeah. Okay. So M asks, I've heard that WordPress is old fashioned, clunky and not user friendly. Can you recommend a web hosting site that a specialist would respect working with? Um, so I would... I would disagree that it's old fashioned and clunky. I think that there is, so there was this WordPress blog, which is separate than building a WordPress site. And so um, actually WordPress is one of the most user-friendly, I mean, other than these like Wix and Squarespace options, um, WordPress is actually very user-friendly compared to other really popular open source platforms such as Drupal. So I would actually say that it is very user-friendly and I think that I think that there is a misconception of what it can do. Um, and I actually think that, uh, you know, in terms of, so web hosting is different than what the CMS you're building on. So hosting is, um, is where your files for your website are kept. And then the actual website, the CMS, as we call it, the content management system is stuff like WordPress and Drupal. Um, and so I just wanna separate that. And if you Google it, it'll pop up everywhere. Um, but in terms of what a specialist would respect working with, I, I think the biggest thing there is some specialists prefer certain technologies. For me, it's almost, John might disagree with this, but I think it's, for me, it's not, I don't even prefer technologies because I'm like, this is necessarily that much better, but it's familiarity is a big thing and also robustness and reliability. So WordPress is quite reliable. The community is big. Drupal, the word, the community is even more validated and even bigger. So sometimes we prefer it for those reasons. Okay, I'm gonna go yeah. into, there's, sorry, uh, there's two more WordPress questions that Jai- I see that, yeah. yeah. Okay, do you wanna go ahead then? Well, just to, to, to kind of like comment on what Angie was saying, I mean, I, I, first I would, I agree with Angie that I, I don't think that WordPress is clunky or old fashioned. I think that 
you know, one thing to consider is that, that vendors typically work with certain tools. So it's a really great question up front to ask, like, what sites do you primarily work in? Because most, you know, have got a, a wide range of experience, but what are the ones they're most comfortable in? And that will give you a good idea about what technology they're going to recommend. I also think the WordPress community is much, much larger than the Drupal community. But I think that the, the thing that's really key about WordPress and why it took off is, is that it has this enormous marketplace. Um, and that has created this like huge market of people that can create things for sale. So you can buy add-ons to the basic functionality of WordPress that a lot of people are very keen on. Um, WordPress definitely is the largest um, content management system that people are using today. I think the question of like whether you want to use WordPress and you know the notion of open source um, is just one where you have the opportunity to use software, you know, for free. Um, but as I like to say, it's free as in puppies, not as in beer. Like there's work involved in taking that open source content management system and, and applying it. And usually you're hiring a vendor to do the customization of that WordPress, um, you know, code base, and then to choose the different add-ons that together make up the functionality and features that you need. Um, I think that the difference between WordPress and Squarespace and Wix, and then, you know, maybe, um, uh, and you can comment on this too, is that like from my perspective, if you're an organization that has certain things that you want to do feature wise, like for example, you want to do ticketing or you have programs that you want to, um, you know, have a sign up or you have members that you want to manage, you can do those things through a WordPress site. And WordPress, you know, like nowadays between five and $10,000 should get you a pretty good basic WordPress site with, you know, a number of different, you know, features and functionality, maybe, you know, some basic e-commerce, but maybe not like ticketing and, you know, a membership, you know, um, system. But Squarespace and Wix, um, and then there's a number of other ones like that, um, strikingly, like there's a number of them that are basically... If you can use Facebook, then you can use most of these other sites. And what they are really is, is that for a monthly fee, uh, they will handle everything. So updating and all of the different aspects of, you know, looking after the care and maintenance. And all you have to do is really enter the content. And so, you know, uh, Squarespace is, starts at 19 US a month. And so for many organizations that just need a basic, and I would kind of label this as sort of informational slash brochure where uh, maybe some basic functionality, you know, maybe you want to sell some merchandise, um, you know, those kinds of things actually are really easily done on Squarespace and Wix. So it's kind of like a basic level and then maybe your WordPress and then I'd put Drupal and other content management systems in that order. Andrew, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I have an anecdote that's really helpful around the difference between Squarespace and Wix and WordPress, which is uh, an experience I'm having with a client right now who um, they, they chose Squarespace for all the reasons that Jai explained, you know, easy to use, like usability um, and less overhead in terms of taking care of the site. But then there came this moment where the client was trying to move something on their site, like I want to move this over here. And it was really difficult to do. So I would say Squarespace is more difficult for to customize sometimes. Um, you can get trapped in whatever template you're stuck in. So something like WordPress and definitely with Drupal, you can you can have a lot more freedom to do that kind of stuff, but then that also requires those skills. And so now you're looking at bringing in a specialist or a developer. Um, but otherwise, yeah, the other thing I want to point out is Squarespace and Wix are hosted on American servers because they host themselves, whereas uh, stuff like WordPress, you can choose to host on Canadian servers, which is um, an important thing for us as we deal with member data and uh, staying in compliance with, you know, FIPA or, you know, your PI, your PIA assessments. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, and just to be clear, too, like, you know, um, the idea with WordPress as a content management system, that code base that I was talking about, usually you host it on a, on a, on a web server. And those web servers can be, you know, like somebody mentioned GoDaddy. Um, and by the way, their CMS is terrible. I would not use it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do not like it. Um, but the point is, is that like, or you can do, for example, Andrew works with a, um, a cooperative hosting company here called CanTrust. Um, and, you know, you pay per month to host it. 
and sometimes th what's nice about that is that those folks um, like, uh, you know, and I use Cantrust, so I don't mind giving them the plug that, you know, they're very helpful and they'll, you know, address issues that arise. Um, Squarespace and Wix do that as well, but you're paying for the whole thing there. Um, and so what it can look like, for example, Cantrust is sort of basic, you know, uh, per month, I think it's like 40 bucks. So 40 times 12, you know, that's not inexpensive. Um, and then you're hosting this software on top of it. And then you may be using add-ons that also cost you money. Like for example, if you're doing e-commerce with WooCommerce and Square or Stripe, you might be paying some percentage of that, or you're using um, a more sophisticated plugin that requires you buying it. Those kinds of things will start to add up. So if you need more functionality, WordPress is more flexible. Um, if you're just looking at a really basic aspect, then Squarespace and Wix are probably going to do the good job for you. Um, do you want to tackle that next question there, Andrew? Actually, what I want to do is I just want to say one other thing here is yeah. that on February 24th, Rox, you're doing an Ask Me Anything that's solely about setting up a website. So okay. it's, it's, true. And we have one more website question that I want to go back to Joanna's um, question. But um, so let's mm -hmm. go to Wendy's if we can first because okay. it's still in this realm of websites. If we're planning to do a rebrand within the year, but we also need a new website, the old one's on its last legs, would it be fairly easy to have an interim website and then implement the new branding after? <laughs> Multi-layer question there. Yeah, I feel like, so for me, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of prototyping. I feel like there's so much learning that happens in a live environment. So I, Personally, I always loved the idea of having uh, slow incremental or iterations of what we're trying to build. Cause then when you finally get to your big like final project, you can actually throw the money at it and it's going to the right. Oh, I'm so sorry. She loves to be on camera. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, that's that for me is a big thing is being able to do this in steps. And I think also when we think about our capacity as nonprofit and arts folks, like our sector, um, I think it also matches our capacity better to work incrementally or with interim solutions because it allows us to adapt and to learn and to apply our learnings, which is for me a very important way uh, um, that I approach technology. Anything that I build myself, I also do in this way. Um, there is one threat that I have, which is if you build something and then you bring in branding later and Jai can really speak to this because he teaches us at Emily Carr, but um, my worry would be bringing it in later might have you make different design decisions. So you might build something that is um, without your branding implemented, you might later realize, oh, we should have built it this way because it's more in line with our branding. So if your branding is about being like fresh and like super minimal, you might not want to have like a heavy nav bar at the top and then you've, you've built it already. So you have to remove that later. Um, so I think there's benefits to both. And it's a matter of what's more important, which is either to later do less work or to learn more as you go so that you build the right thing later. Cool. Jai, did you want to take a little bit of that or do you want me to move to the next question? Oh, uh, no, sure. I'll just quickly say that, like, you know, um, this is a pretty common use case, um, I would say. And, you know, like uh, what we call them as placeholder sites. Um, and that placeholder site is usually, you know, it can be spun up quite quickly. This might be a good place for, you know, Squarespace or Wix. And you can use like a really quick, um, you know, version and, you know, indicate on that site that it is going to be upgraded or you're, you're, you're redoing your, your, your branding so that people understand that the functionality might be coming. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you say on its last legs, I, I'm guessing that it could be that you're on WordPress and it's on a version that the theme isn't supported or anything like that. But there's also, you know, possibilities of using what I would say, you know, um, would just be to potentially update the WordPress core and maybe use a different theme. Um, sometimes you can upgrade, you know, by replacing um, a WordPress theme, and then that can give your website, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, opportunity uh, to live before you redo it completely. Because redoing completely usually means you're going to be redoing the menu, the content, the look and feel, and especially if you're doing a rebrand. So you might be able to get away with simply looking at like what exactly do you mean by it's not on its last legs. And see if you can do that, or you can just replace it with, like I said, a placeholder site that has minimal functionality. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go to Joanna's question and then come back down. Um, okay. 
So thank you, Joanna saying thank you, uh, Alliance Andrew and Jai. So the BC Touring Council wants to update our 20 year old custom developed file maker database. Woo! I would like to have <laughs> advice and consulting. Is there a list? This is such a good question. How to prepare to maximize the consultation? And then are you available? Which you can chat about later. But tips for maximizing that consultative period there, particularly around database updating. Um, I would, right off the bat, when I hear database, I jump to privacy. And um, uh, a project I worked on recently um, really waited far too long to touch the privacy pieces and it cost them a lot of money to deal with it later. So I just wanna throw up there right up front before you engage a consultant, I would suggest doing a privacy impact assessment and understanding your privacy needs for your organization and the type of data that you hold. And that also includes data security. And that means that when the consultation, the consultant comes in, you're best using them as a resource to answer the right questions. So for like going back to Jai's uh, delineation between like WordPress and Squarespace and Wix, um, if, if you engage someone like Jai, he might answer differently based on what your data security needs are. So right off the bat, I think having your ducks in a row, so to speak, I think is a good way to prepare to maximize the consultation. So right off, so privacy, data security, understanding how that works, understanding how your organization works. Um, I also think that um, knowing that, uh, you know, what's not working versus what you need, which, which is often called a needs assessment, um, which allows us to understand what you want to build. And this is stuff that we can come in and that we do in our roles, but you can really save the organization a lot of money and time if you do this ahead of time. And it's okay if you don't have it all ahead of time, but to give us as much information as possible. So knowing what didn't work, what you need built, um, what the parameters are around security and privacy. Um, yeah, I think that for me, the, the database word, because that usually implies private information is what's making me a little bit nervous around that. Guy? Yeah, I mean, I would add, I mean, you know, first off, I'm, you know, guessing if it's kind of BCTC, you probably have this custom database, you're keeping track of organizations and the touring requests, probably like granting database maybe. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, and if it's in FileMaker and you've been using it on the desktop now with the pandemic and everybody, you're probably thinking, well, how can I access this remotely? I know that FileMaker does have a cloud-based version of FileMaker now. Mm -hmm. So you could look into seeing what the process would be just to move your FileMaker um, to the cloud so that you could have multiple access. If it's just for, you know, um, for staff, um, then that might be a really kind of inexpensive way. I think there's some limitations on the cloud, but, you know, it's certainly better than, you know, uh, some of my clients have used Access um, and file, uh, Microsoft has really abandoned access. And so you're kind of stuck in having to rebuild it in SQL Server. But FileMaker does have that you know, option. And depending on how old and how complex and, con and, and custom built, you might be able just to, to move it. Yeah, okay, so you are already doing that. And then in terms of like, you know, the next level would be, well, what other aspects are you not doing now that you might want to do with if that data was online? So for example, would that mean uh, organizations could apply for BCTC, you know, online. So it's an online application aspect, you know, in those kinds of areas. And if that's the case, and you're thinking about, well, what are those things? Then, you know, one of the, the things that I do, you know, I sort of first try and do an ecosystem map, you know, so that I kind of get all of the, the different bits and bobs. And there's lots of mind mapping tools that you can um, use to do that. I use Miro, M-I-R-O. I'll put that in the, or, um, or Andrew, could you do that, Miro? And I also mm -hmm. used Padlet, P-A-D-L-E-T.com. Both of those are really simple tools. Um, Padlet, very simple that you can use to map out your, your kind of aspect. And then the second thing that I would really do is look at what your requirements are and just think about like, well, what's the vision that you have of like what the database would do? Um, and that's a really exciting place to kind of start. And you can, you know, do that in a number of different ways. I've done that in... Um, you know, either um, just asking questions or even just writing, uh, you know, imagining, you know, two years in the future, you know, Joanna, you're sitting down in the, the BCTC office and thinking about, you know, describing what you see and putting yourself in that future forward 
area, you know, and, uh, you know, artists all throughout the province are able to apply online without hassle. They're able to check the status of their application. Uh, you know, um, the staff at BCTC can uh, evaluate and assess. They can send to external, you know, assessors, all of that. Anyway, I'm getting the, the nod from Sue there, but I'll just wrap that up with by saying, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a cheap solution and a more expansive um, visioning. So I'm going to just throw in something. You can tell me if I'm wrong, but my take is when working with consultants and um, service providers, what you first want to do is go, what is the functionality I need? Like, what are the things I'm going to need to do with my website? What are the things I need to do with my database, whatever it is? And what are my big concerns around it? Like the privacy and all that stuff, cost, um, can I update? And then to actually get those lists at, at prepared for your meeting with a consultant. So I'm sort of tying in a bunch of things from the conversation. And your uh, Jai, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, we're going to move now into uh, a couple more questions about um, WordPress. But I'm also going to encourage those of you who may have itchy, scratchy kind of problems or questions that haven't spoken yet to please throw them into the chat so that we can include all voices. Um, but we have a couple WordPress things. One is we use Elementor for editing WordPress. Are there other editing tools? And also Gail's question, is there a free WordPress theme that you recommend? So Elementor, editing tools, and themes that you would recommend. Let's take those on. Um, I use Elementor. I really, I really like it. Um, with WordPress, you can actually override pretty easily with CSS and HTML. So I find that I have a lot of uh, functionality and, or not functionality, a lot of um, access to, to make changes. So um, I find it very easy. It's a very, I think Elementor is very popular. Um, lots of people seem to use it. Um, and then in terms of a free WordPress theme, I, I fell down this trap of using a lot of free themes and then it started to, I'd go to someone else's website, I'd go, ah, it all looks the same. And like, mine doesn't look that different. And then when I started to look into replacing with paid themes, I realized they actually weren't very expensive at all. And so for me, it was worth it to pay the 15 bucks. And this is not like a monthly fee. This is a one-time fee um, to use a good reputable theme from a good reputable company that um, I just found it just gave me exactly what I wanted. So um, I don't know if I have free themes I'd recommend because lately I've been opting to just pay for something um, that's exactly what I want. It saves me a lot of time and it looks better. It looks unique. And um, yeah, that's that's where I'd answer those two. Jai, do you yeah, I would um, I double down on Elementor. I, I've used WP Bakery a lot on Elementor and I still like Elementor more. Um, there's a number of different um, kind of you know, basically um, site development tools that work in conjunction with WordPress. Elementor and WP Bakery are plugins that you add on to the core aspect of WordPress that extends functionality. Elementor is a great one. I do uh, use that a lot. Um, and um, I would also agree with Andrew that, you know, free themes, you get what you pay for. And the biggest issue is that you don't get support. Um, and so support becomes a real um, thing. And one of the things I would say is in choosing a theme, um, you know, and the, the idea here is that you can get a developer can make any theme and make it bespoke and, you know, beautiful. Uh, the challenge comes a few years later if you're not working with that same developer. So for example, Powell Street Festival, um, they're a client of mine working on uh, their website. The theme was outdated. The developer had no interest in updating the theme, so we had to replace it. If we had chosen one that was a popular theme, and I think that's one of the things I might suggest, um, I don't always look for a unique. I look for well-supported and a lot of downloads so people are using it and, you know, a clear record of support. Like, you know, people aren't, you know, complaining that they never get back to them. So those are the things that start to really matter. It's sort of like you kind of want reliability um, in those kinds of aspects. Um, again, a developer may come to you and say, well, I can use... I can use a theme and build on top of it like X theme or there's some other sort of like very vanilla themes. Um, but usually if you can get like 80% of the things and look and feel that you want from a particular theme, that's a great place to start. Usually you can kind of close the gap to maybe being 85, 90% of what you want. You'll never get 100%. So if you have a little bit of flexibility around how things will look, um, you usually can get a theme. And, and most themes are more than what Andrew's saying. I would say, Andrew, like I'm thinking they're more like in the 59 US 
Um, you know, for example, on Theme Forest, um, that Theme Forest is a place I usually buy my themes. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, and you can, again, they're sort of a middleman between a whole bunch of other theme vendors. And so you get a better sense of the reliability with the kinds of things that people are talking about in terms of their ratings. Okay, sorry. Right. Okay, I'm going to blow through some things and then I'm going to do a little. So first of all, um, I said, is there a place I can learn how to make WordPress code other than actual school? And Andrew, I believe that's the link, the W3 schools. Is that what that yeah, was? But, uh, but Linda oh, is, no. Yeah, but Lynda.com has courses and they're okay. free if you go through the VPL. That's the important thing. Um, you can get it through your Vancouver Public Library or North Van Library or basically any BC library. Okay. Thank yeah, you. and I was the link that I sent is just because I threw out CSS and HTML without explaining them, so I thought I would throw in the link. But thank you. Okay, so the, Linda, the free uh, through the library system for training. Um, I want, if possible, to do a quick little. Um, there's a throw out here to sumac.com as a CRM that's Canadian held with good mm -hmm. privacy control that's cloud based. If, um, and yeah, I mean, Heidi, I would say Sumac is so-so. I mean, um, you know, the there are a number of different uh, CRM databases, and depending on what your your focus is, Sumac, in my mind, tends to be a little old school with its user interface. But I think that the the biggest thing when you're trying and CRMs are a whole other issue. But looking at trying to match what your feature sets and really importantly, like what your direction of your organization is going in. So you know, you know, for you, if it's fundraising, Sumac's a good fit. Um, you know, if you're looking at volunteer or member management, you know, there's other databases that are also good. Cool. Um, we're going to ask a little bit about your coaching services and what that entails. And I would also like you two to also touch on some of the things we talked about resources and user centered thinking, if we can. Okay. So your coaching and then resources and I keep encouraging people. Okay. And then we're going to get to this other question. Okay. Res um, coaching. And then a little bit on resources and user centered thinking, please go. Um, so I do, I do more consulting. Jai does more coaching. Um, and I think that one thing that was interesting about doing this session together is we're kind of in two different places. Jai has years and years and years of experience that is irreplaceable. Um, and I am, as I mentioned, uh, you know, only 11 years in only uh, into this uh, area of work. Um, but uh, for me, it's more, I'm, always keeping up to date on the newest technologies. I go to, as I mentioned, I'm always in school. I'm always studying these areas and doing certifications. So um, yeah, so the type of consultation that I do, I'm very hands-on with my clients. So I definitely, um, I work very closely with um, digital, uh, digital vendors that they hire. So I will work really closely to make sure that list that you mentioned at the beginning, Sue, where you were saying, these are the things you should have. I just, the only thing I want to say in response to that was, I also don't want to freak everyone out and be like, if you don't have that, you can't do this because people like me can come in and I can support you on making sure you get those things and uh, making sure that your time is used efficiently when you engage people. So that's a big part of what I do. So I do a lot of consultation, helping you figure out what you need to build, what's realistic, really managing your own capacity as well, I think is a big thing. Um, and then building the product. So I really go so far as I will dive in and help with even doing some of the building um, as needed where um, it might be very, very expensive to do it, to get a developer to do things like content, which is doable on our side and sometimes a little bit easier to do. Um, I find because I come from an arts perspective, it's a little bit easier for me to understand why you want to change this copy 10 times. Whereas sometimes a developer goes, why do you keep changing the copy 10 times? But I, I'm from this sector, so I understand we want to engage with our audiences in the most respectful way. Um, so that's more so what, um, what I do in terms of consultation and project management um, and support. And the yeah. other question, oh, sorry. Uh, well, I would just say like around coaching. So actually right now, um, I've been working through Capicoa, but um, the um, Arts BC is um, offering coaching and I'm part of their insight team. Um, so the way that that works is, is that you can request this sort of 10 hour block of hours um, and Arts BC will pay for that. They pay my time. 
Um, so I, I don't know whether that program is still open or not, but I know that I've just started receiving clients from that. But typically my coaching works in that, you know, usually there's some kind of defined project that somebody's looking to do. So, uh, you know, for example, um, I'm, I'm working with a new client in Squamish and, um, you know, they've kind of outlined a few areas. They want to choose a new CRM. Um, they'd like to, to kind of look at their financial kind of, um, you know, infrastructure um, and they want to think about their communications, whether that's social media or whatever. And so I can kind of come in and recommend and work through that issue of, you know, helping them choose. But I'd say that as a coach, like maybe the difference between the, the consultant and the coach is that I'm even less hands on, like I won't go away and do something for you. Um, well, sometimes I will, but majority is like I'm really trying to meet you at where you're at and try and help build capacity with you. Um, because, you know, like we were talking at the beginning, if you know how to do it, then you're going to last a lot much that much longer um, in working with the tools rather than if I do it for you. So that's the kind of difference, I suppose, in the coaching versus consultant. I mean, you can hire me as a consultant as well, but to be honest, my time is so tight these days that I actually prefer coaching. Um, I actually really enjoy it. So that's where I've been kind of moving my practice. And it's kind of interesting because for me, I'm definitely very, I love the hands-on. And so that's, um, and again, my time is also tight, but it's like, I love getting in there. I love the problems, especially the, the really like terrible problems. <laughs> like if it's like, this is a big problem, I'm like, let's do it, let's fix it. So when, they're, when we get into these like nitty gritty, especially when it comes to our sector, serving our sector, um, when we get conceptually stuck, that's a really exciting area for me to work as well. Okay. We've got um, 10 minutes left, so I'm pulling back on my question about user stuff, and I'm now going to go with the ones that are in the chat. Where do you look for freelance editors? And then Robert had asked a more thorough question that I thought had sort of been addressed, but let's try it again. Um, uh, what about fees? Fees to expect to pay for updating a WordPress site and doing a website audit. Okay, so where do you find freelance editors and then kind of rough costs for fees for updating WordPress site and a WordPress audit of functionality and effectiveness? So I would say in terms of finding people, I really, um, we have, you know, I can't emphasize enough how helpful it is to have people who are from the sector or understand this sector to do this kind of work. Um, and so it's very helpful for me to, to find people through word of mouth and to ask around. Um, and that's, I mean, you could put out an ad and, um, you know, the BC Alliance for Arts and Culture job board is something I always rely on. I really love using it. Um, so that would be one, that would be if you're looking to hire something that's a little bit more substantial, but otherwise I would ask for recommendations and word of mouth um, and seeing what other people, who other people are using. So maybe go to someone's website that you really like an organization around the same size as yours and just reach out. I mean, we are a community and just say, hey, who do you use for this? And in terms of rates, this is, uh, I had to smile at this because it's a really interesting question because rates are so like, they range so much and you can get like, you know, I just, I'm working on a project right now where I have like basically somebody who's just left school, his rate is very, very low. And I asked him to do some work and that was great. Um, but I noticed that, you know, someone who with a much higher rate, they're doing it much faster. So I found that really interesting that it took him so many hours to do this work that in the end, it worked out to being the same. And it's like just really about experience. So um, I think that the fees for me, I mean, I've seen, I have a friend who charges as low as $25 an hour to do WordPress work, which, because um, he's straight out of school. And then we have people that are charging, you know, some developers or firms are upwards of $150 an hour. Jai would be able to speak more to this, I'm sure. And yeah. then in terms of doing an, oh, sorry, in terms of doing an audit and functionality, I think, again, that depends if you're engaging a firm or a freelancer would be the difference for me. Okay, Robert's got a follow-up question he sent to me, uh, just about updating an existing site, like hourly rates for updating an existing WordPress site. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I'll take that. I mean. You know, typically you can expect to pay between 50 and 80 for a local WordPress developer, I would say per hour. Um, and, you know, most of the work in WordPress is done better by the hour. Um, you know, you can get into, um, you know, different levels of, um, you know, maintenance, you know, a couple hundred dollars a quarter and, you know, they'll kind of maintain the site. 
I think that, you know, if you're looking, you know, that's, that would be a freelancer. I think the difference is, is that when you're obviously you're working with a freelancer, you're working with one person and you always hear the, the horror stories that that person goes dark. You can't get a hold of them. They don't give you the information. They get grumpy, whatever the case may be. That is the difference that you're paying for when you um, work with an agency. So agencies, yeah, you know, will start at, you know, over a hundred dollars and up, you know, some of the agencies are 200 now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the, and, and they'll, they'll bring like multiple people. So in a meeting, you'll have like four people. So they can add up very, very quickly. Um, and those larger ones, it is better to try and move towards like a fixed fee or some kind of agreed upon um, milestone delivery rather than an hourly. Um, usually uh, agencies will build around uh, an estimate of hours. And then if they're, you know, useful and you, good people, they could potentially turn that into a flat fleet, fat flat fee engagement, um, <laughs> a fat fee. That's maybe a little Freudian slip. Um, but, uh, you know, the point being that like, yeah, if you're going to look for a freelancer, you know, you're, you're taking on some of the risk. So it's, it's a good question to ask, like how much, you know, where do you want your problems to be? So if you want your problems to be like, you know, you want, um, uh, reliability and all those kinds of things, you can find the right freelancer. Um, but again, you can run into these other issues. If you want your problem to be that you, you know, are, 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 you know, not having to scrimp and save to afford an agency, then the freelancer can make sense as well. Okay, five minutes left, two hefty questions, very different. Okay, first question, Chelsea, my needs are more basic, getting like getting programs, file management, software, ugh, things are moving, pro software programs, equipment synced amongst our team members and appropriate upgrades. Any recommendations? More basic. Yep. Do you want me to go or you want to go, Andrew? Yeah, I'm still reading it. So yeah, okay. I'll let you go. So I mean, basically what I see in my clients is there's two basic platforms that people choose. One is that they're in the Microsoft ecosystem with they're mm -hmm. using Office 365 or they're in the Google um, uh, ecosystem using Google Workspace. Um, both of those allow you know the kinds of functionality that you're describing. Um, so you can do both. Like for example, one of my clients um, uses Google Workspace for all of their email drive storage, um, but then they use um, the Office Suite for their um, you know desktop. Um, so they'll write in Microsoft Word um, and then share those files um, you know online. Um, so you can do, you know, kind of a mixture of things. Um, I mean, I'm sure and I'm hoping everyone has heard of TechSoup. Um, TechSoup.ca will allow you to access Google uh, Workspace um, uh, for free and Microsoft Office 365 for a discount. But those are the two that, that, that would be, in my mind, the major decision that any arts organization would make um, right off the top, which one of those you would want to use. And those uh, TechSoup allows you to because you're a nonprofit. You have to have nonprofit status to get there. That's right. TechSoup is only for um, not for profits in Canada. Okay, we're going to go now into William's question. I'm going to try and read the two parts. Any notable platforms at this point offering innovations available in the trends towards touch-based mobile interfaces, including including or as well as social media hooks versus hmm. I'm not sure what that part is. Uh, uh, desktop office or desktop PCs, mouse face interfaces. Um, any interest in the same among this group? And uh, also for IE for both content management as well as public organizational communications, which might integrate with existing mobile tools, writing, video, photo, calendaring, and Zooming. So really notable platforms yeah. offering innovations in the trends towards touch-based mobile interfaces. Yeah, that's pretty specific. I mean, not not off the top of my head, um, Andrew. Any ideas? Uh, no, it just kind of reminds me of some of the technologies that are being developed for the purposes of accessibility. Um, mm -hmm. I had some experiences doing some testing with some um, paraplegic and quadriplegic folks where they were using um, different technologies to, you know, interact with digital media. So not not a mouse, and so this interests me, but. Um, and I think there's a lot of work being done in it for a lot of reasons that go beyond accessibility, which is just behavior, digital behavior today. But yeah, I don't have anything right off the top of my head. Hot damn, two minutes left. Anybody got a <laughs> People are starting to leave because they have to click out to get to their next meeting and go pee. <laughs> if not, I am going to say thank you, everybody. This was the only AMA that's happening on a Tuesday. All our other AMAs are happening on Wednesday. 
please sign up. You're welcome to come. We love the questions. We love the energy and we love learning together. Thank you to Anju. Thank you to Jai. Thank you to Joyce. Thank you to the Alliance. Thank you to the Canada Council. May you have a fantastic rest of your day. Take thank care. Thank you to our ASL interpreters. Thanks. And thanks to you, Sue. Thank you to the ASL interpreters. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>